Good afternoon. This event is being closed captioned. CC should appear on the controls at the bottom of your screen. Please click the CC to turn it on. I'm Gigi Dopico, NYU's Vice Provost for Undergraduate Academic Affairs and for the Humanities. And it's my great privilege to introduce you to our panel, to welcome you to our panel this afternoon on racial justice and prison education. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to honor those who came before us and acknowledge the indigenous peoples whose lands we now occupy. I also want to honor and remember those whose lives have been lost in acts of anti-Black violence, those known to us and those unknown to us, as well as those whose lives have been impacted or lost due to mass incarceration. The number of incarcerated Americans today is roughly 2.3 million people nearly 700 per 100,000, representing the highest incarceration rate of any nation in the world. The racial disparities of that population are much like those of the COVID pandemic, with marginalized communities, Black, Hispanic, Indigenous, people of color, disproportionately represented. NYU's Prison Education Program was founded in 2015 to demonstrate how a research university can help address the social problem of mass incarceration and expand access to education within the most underserved communities. Our panel today features two directors and two alumni of our prison ed program. Today's event is part of NYU Reads, an initiative that seeks to bring the entire university community together to read and discuss a single book. This afternoon's program is also part of NYU Be Together, Global Scholars and Innovators series sponsored by the Office of Global Inclusion. This year's NYU Read selection, chosen by a university-wide committee of students, faculty, and staff, is NYU law professor Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, A Story of Justice and Redemption. Our panelists will offer a reflection on Just Mercy and on the relation between racial justice and education. I want to extend some thanks First and foremost, to all the critical frontline workers who are helping us get through these difficult times, to the whole team at the Office of Global Inclusion, and in particular, Drs. Lisa Coleman and Karen Jackson Weaver. Thanks too to Libraries Dean Austin Booth, to the faculty teaching the NYU Reads course, and to the entire division of libraries. Thanks to the NYU Reads Committee, to Provost Catherine Fleming, and to Associate Vice Provost Brian Pointer. To all the faculty, students, and staff of PEP, in particular founding director Nikhil Singh, and to our partners at the Mellon Foundation, without whom PEP would not be possible. Finally, let me thank NYU President Andrew Hamilton for his strong advocacy and support of NYU Reads, and especially of the Prison Education Program. Not every president would have been as courageous, and we are a better university for it. And now it is my honor to introduce President Hamilton, who will present our panel. Gigi, <laughs> thank you very much. And I will want you to give me a little thumbs up if you can hear me. So uh, excellent, good. I've got, apologies everyone, I've got a little technical problem at my end. But let me thank Gigi and let me thank all of you for participating in this afternoon's event. I also want to thank NYU Reads and the Office of Global Inclusions, NYU Be Together, Global Scholars and Innovators, Innovators Series for organizing this event. Now this spring we all watched as the latest grievous examples of racial injustice and racial violence gripped the country. They took place against the backdrop, of course, of the COVID-19 pandemic, which we all know has disproportionately affected people of color and incarcerated people. Of course, these are not new issues for the country. They are the result and a continuation of generations of structural racism. At NYU, researchers across the university are working to combat racial injustice 
and advance the rights and the well-being of vulnerable people and of prison populations. Today's event is the result of several of those efforts. NYU Reads brings the entire NYU community together around a common reading. This fall, the book is Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, professor at NYU's School of Law and founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. Just Mercy has allowed us to deepen our understanding of the inherent injustices in the criminal justice system and the experience of incarcerated people in America's prisons. And that many NYU Reads events planned for this semester, like today's event, helps us understand and advance discussion on these important topics. Today's event also centers on another key NYU initiative, the NYU Prison Education Program. Since NYU PEP's founding in 2015, nearly 300 people incarcerated at the Wallkill Correctional Facility in New York State. More than 300 people have earned NYU credits through courses taught by NYU faculty. 14 students have earned their associate degrees through the program. Five have gone on to earn bachelor's degrees post-release and 11 have transferred to degree programs on NYU's Washington Square campus, including, I'm pleased to say, two of our panelists today. And for the past several years, I've had the honor to travel to Wallkill and to preside at a graduation ceremony there with, let me say, all the pomp, all the ceremony, and all the violet bling that we would normally associate with an NYU graduation ceremony. And I can say from meeting this NYU PEP students there and alumni of the program, that they are some of the most motivated and engaged students I have ever encountered. And that is perhaps even more the case since the pandemic began. Neither in-person nor online courses have been possible at Wallkill due to limitations on internet usage. But NYU PEP students have persevered in their learning thanks to mailed readings and letters from faculty, pre-recorded faculty video lectures, and the occasional discussion via teleconference. As you'll hear today, NYU's prison education program and others like it can have truly transformational effects on the lives of incarcerated people. We are extremely proud of NYU's prison education program and the dedicated faculty, staff, and students, including today's distinguished panelists, who make it happen. Now it's my very great pleasure to introduce today's panelists. And let me begin with Nikhil Singh. And Nikhil is a professor of social and cultural analysis at the Faculty of Arts and Science and the founding faculty director of the NYU Prison Education Program. He's a historian of race, empire, and culture in 20th century United States. He's the author of several books and has contributed to NPR and other major media outlets. Our second panelist is Jose Diaz. And Jose is an alumnus, again, of NYU's prison education program, but is currently a master's student in social and cultural analysis at NYU with an emphasis on Latino studies. In his thesis work on stickball, he seeks to unravel colonial narratives that underlie common notions of race, class, and gender. He is also a writer, and as we will soon discover, a public speaker. Our third panelist is Zachary Gillespie. And Zachary is also an alumnus of NYU PEP, and a current bachelor's student at NYU, majoring in social and cultural analysis 
with an emphasis on American studies. His academic interests lie in the areas of race and the criminal justice system. And then finally, Caitlin Noss. Caitlin is the executive director of the NYU Prison Education Program and will be moderating the discussion today. Caitlin completed her PhD in American Studies at NYU in 2020 and has an academic background in sociology, equity studies, adult education, and community organizing. Let me thank all of the panelists for participating today. Let me thank all of you attending. And I also look forward, as all of you do, to today's discussion, not only the interesting and informative character of the discussion, but as we will see, the way in which the discussion will help us both understand, gain insight, but also advance progress on all of these important issues. Thank you all, and over to you, Caitlin. Thank you so much, President Hamilton. And thank you to the Global Scholar and Innovator Series and to NYU Reads for this opportunity to share our work as NYU's prison education program. I really want to echo Gigi's um, specific note that it is no small thing in the US context to have such a committed and consistent support for a program like ours and from the president of our university. And I can say with certainty and deep gratitude on behalf of the entire panel that we wouldn't be here today without this kind of institutional support and the efforts of President Hamilton in particular. So thank you, we are very honored to be here and to have you all here. My role today will be to moderate our panel and first to provide just a brief frame for our discussion. There has been in the last six months of upheaval also a great deal of important debate about the structure, the purpose, and even the very language of prison education. These are necessary discussions that reflect the complexity of the work between correctional facilities and educational programs and the vital importance of having a clear mission and the critical analysis within a very contradictory landscape. This afternoon, we will share a bit more about our work through this program, and we also hope to demonstrate how the NYU prison education program that you might hear, hear affectionately referred to as PEP today, um, how we engage in this terrain through research, through pedagogy, and through community building. You will hear first a series of remarks from our faculty director, Nikhil Singh, then from MA student, Jose Diaz, and then BA student, Zach Gillespie. Each will respond to a thread in Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, and bring this text into conversation with several other pieces of scholarship, which I believe will be linked to the audience in the chat. Um, these include work by our own Nikhil Singh, sociologist Louis Quacamp, and an interview with PEP advisory board member, Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore from the New York Times. Together, these texts help us understand the power and potential of higher education inside correctional facilities as a matter of racial justice particularly in this time of a reconsolidating and reasserted white supremacy and the rising liberation movements of black, indigenous, and multiracial people. This requires a critical understanding of the roles of prison in our society and confronting the myths that incarceration creates public safety. If our panel discussion today had a kind of thesis statement, it might be these words recently shared by our Mellon postdoctoral fellow and critical geography scholar, Dr. Lydia pellot Hobbs. She said in a recent program discussion, the primary thing that prisons produce is formerly incarcerated people. Prisons reproduce surplus populations that are always racialized, classed, and gendered, whether through the framework of rehabilitation or punishment. If we understand that, then education inside prison becomes a way to interrupt the incapacitation and warehousing of human beings and to provide a new horizon toward which students can lead their own lives. And to this I would add, and now for the purpose of turning directly to our panelists who will offer their own brilliant commentary, 
that to address the historic crisis of hyper incarceration, we must widen our understanding of what racial justice means in this area and be rigorous in our thinking beyond just the site of the prison itself and perhaps including new critical ways and roles of the, the purpose of higher education in this moment more broadly. Following our three panelists and a brief round of responses, we will open at 1.25 Eastern time for some Q&A from those of you listening. We really look forward to the discussion today and all those that come ahead. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Singh. Thank you so much, um, Caitlin, for those wonderful opening remarks. Um, there are always so many people to thank when uh, doing an event like this. It takes a real large community effort to produce this. So I wanna just echo the thanks that uh, Gigi Dopico offered to uh, everyone who helped put on this event and also to President Hamilton for taking time from his busy schedule to, to introduce us. And I also, uh, in advance of their remarks, wanna thank Jose Diaz and Zach Gillespie for agreeing to participate and share their, their insights and experiences with us. I'm going to start and I'm going to echo a little bit of what has already been said to give a context for our work and then try to go a little bit further into it. Um, mass incarceration is a crisis of economic and racial justice, racial injustice, the result of an overinvestment in prisons and a neglect of education and community services for poor communities. The NYU Prison Education Program started in 2015 by faculty, administrators, and staff members who believe the university has a critical role to play in addressing this urgent collective problem and source of social injustice. In 1975, the numbers of Americans in local jails, state, and federal prisons was around 400,000. Today it is above 2 million, the highest incarceration rate of any nation in the world. When we think of prisons, we need to also account for jails where many find themselves incarcerated awaiting trial and uncounted in these staggering statistics. Though released from prison, some 10 million people remain under criminal state supervision, on parole, confined in their movement, and in many cases denied the right to vote. In a country of over 300 million people, some 70 million people now have some form of criminal arrest or conviction record. This is not an isolated question or issue. It is not something that is confined to one particular community. It is a form of social control and punishment that has come to define the country as a whole. Racial disparities in our carceral system have been well documented with those incarcerated disproportionately from the urban poor and African Americans and Latinos in particular, groups that have also been underserved by public educational institutions and channeled into what is now known as a school to prison pipeline. This was not an accidental event, although it grew up over a long period of time. The rise of mass incarceration was heralded by a specific set of policy shifts emphasizing law and order and uh, moving away from social welfare approaches, particularly to poverty, unemployment, and education. The decision to govern poor people by prioritizing criminal punishment was also characterized by a retreat from societal commitment to remedy historic racial injustice, which had long depended upon the segregation and spatial confinement of African American communities suffering from substandard housing, high levels of unemployment, and punitive policing. The destructive impact of the turn to law and order and hyper incarceration upon the communities most impacted by it was intensified by a rejection of models of rehabilitation in favor of punishment. In the 1990s and early 2000s, we saw a sharp decline in federally funded prison education programs during the rise of mass incarceration, despite considerable evidence that higher education in prison was a low cost, is a low cost, and successful means of addressing the educational failures that have long proven to be one of the primary pathways into prison. 
it has become common in light of these oft observed racial disparities and social failures in the wake of the important work of Michelle Alexander to think of mass incarceration as what she has called the new Jim Crow or as a successor to the main forms of racial domination that have occurred throughout US history, slavery, legal segregation, and urban apartheid. The Jim Crow analogy, as James Foreman Jr. has observed, draws particular attention to the plight of black men and women whose opportunities in life have been permanently diminished by the loss of citizenship rights and the stigma they suffer as convicted offenders. It highlights how politicians and prosecutors waged a war on drugs, one that surreptitiously stoked fears of black crime and led to the unfair targeting of African-American communities. But it is important to be specific in our understanding of what led to the rise of mass incarceration and what defines its main characteristics. Foreman, Loic Wakant, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and many others have observed that the stupendous expansion of US policing, courts, and prisons has been targeted first by class, second by race, and third by place. The war on drugs accounts for only about 25% of people in prison. And among the fastest growing portion of people incarcerated today live in predominantly white rural counties in the United States. You may be surprised to learn that the greatest single indicator of whether someone ends up in prison is whether or not that person completed a high school degree. And in some poorer parts of the country, prison construction and prison labor, such as guarding and administration, has become one of the only sources of employment in the region, including in many ways where we now work in upstate New York. It is important to observe as well that prison and police and spending for prison and police increased even as crime was steadily falling in the United States beginning in the mid 1990s. What is most staggering about this is that a veritable prison boom accompanied a program of virtual austerity in municipal government and social welfare spending. Expanding government expenditures on policing and prison, in other words, were coupled with dramatic cuts to expenditures on public housing, public assistance, and food stamps. The current call that you may have heard in some of the recent protests in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd to, quote, defund the police, a slogan which has become quite prominent needs to be put in this context. The slogan, in other words, is not simply about the police. It is about the entire expansion of the criminal punishment complex and the way in which that expansion directly siphoned resources away from public housing, public education, and public welfare. And to that, we might even add public health in this moment of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's an indictment of the way in which social priorities and social spending have skewed towards policing and punishment at the expense of a broad commitment to human flourishing in our society. Now our own efforts in the prison education program have been more modest, but they also reflect an effort to engage the challenges of shrinking the prison complex by filling the enormous gaps in educational access and economic opportunity that it has exacerbated and reproduced. NYU PEP offers college courses for credit towards an associate degree in liberal studies at Wallkill Correctional Facility, a medium security prison in Ulster County, New York. Our program is unique among its peers in maintaining a commitment to our students upon release from prison. PEP, as we are affectionately known, as Caitlin mentioned, offers pathways for successful re-entry through continuing education and holistic services for students. 
through these pathways and, strate and the strategic university and community partnerships necessary to sustain them, we now serve hundreds of students who have been released to the five boroughs of New York City and to upstate New York since we started our program in 2015. PEP's approach linking college and prison to post-release adult learning and professional development is informed by a wider theory of change that first views the, fun, views the development and deepening and in many cases, restoration of the social networks of formerly incarcerated people as a dimension of successful reentry, community reinvestment, and the creation of a healthy civic culture beyond prison. And second, that seeks to model how a private urban research university can leverage the assembled expertise, social capital, space, and financial resources in the public interest to address racially disparate impacts and collateral consequences of mass incarceration within the underserved communities that are all around NYU, just a few miles away from where we now study and learn. In short, and I'm going to conclude here and look forward to hearing the remarks of our students, Zach and Jose, and then moving to the discussion. In short, we are interested in cultivating practices of freedom. Freedom, that word so central to the American political understanding, and yet one contradicted daily by a society that has uniquely innovated forms of unfreedom. As social theorist Avery Gordon writes, freedom as a practice is one that can only happen in relation with others. And as one of the inspirations for our work and a member of our advisory board, Ruth Wilson Gilmore has argued, instead of asking whether anyone should be locked up or go free, why don't we think about why we solve problems by repeating the kind of vengeful and violent behavior that brought us to this place in the first place. In the effort of trying to interrupt, as Caitlin said, to disrupt the pattern and cycles of incarceration that have grown and metastasized in the United States over three decades, we seek a different way forward one that addresses the manifold problems we face in employment, public health, and education, and an approach that points beyond police, prison, and punishment. So thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm really looking forward to continuing the discussion. So I wanna turn it over now um, to uh, Jose and Zach. I'm not sure who's going first. That would be Jose. Unfortunately, Jose, <laughs> as I sit here very nervously, listen to everybody's speech. Um, I just really want to thank everyone for allowing me to be here. And I can never conceive upon me first sitting down and actually meeting Nikhil and having my interview with Nikhil as to whether I will get in NYU at Wall Kill that I will be here in this panel today. And it's very like remarkable. Um, and also like to kind of like touch on what President Hamilton had said about having an impact on, of the lives on people and PEP providing a space for us as people who have been impacted to have the impact on the lives of the people in our community. It's very important. It's something that we are really dedicated in it, with PEP to kind of like spreading. And that's what we've been doing this summer. One of the things that I like to also think about um, is how my experience as a person who has been incarcerated kind of steps into these spaces and engages with the theory. And there was something in Brian's book that really stuck out to me. And, um, and I believe it's in the second chapter. And this is in regards to him going home late one day and he was um, harassed by an officer because they were supposed burglars in the neighborhood and just him being black and in that specific neighborhood, as we were thinking about Loic Quan, it's about race, class and, and space. And, and that all operates within in the framing of his book as well. And what he writes about is how the neighbors who came out and saw him being harassed by the police and what they did. So here's the quote. The neighbors looked me over one last time before retreating back in their homes. I couldn't decide whether I should race to my door, 
so they so that they could see that I lived in my neighborhood or wait until they were gone so that one could know where the suspected criminal lived. I decided to wait, end quote. And I think what he's really looking at is a lot of the shame that it accompanies, that is accompanied that is in company with being a person who's stigmatized, one. But then if we were to think about um, something that Louis Quant says in his in this particular re reading we have today, which is um, about um, class, race, and hyper and, uh, incarceration in, in Revanchist America, he says that the stigma of criminal conviction was deepened and diffused in ways that make going to jail akin to racial dishonor. And I think it's really interesting to look at the ways in which one who's been incarcerated is racially dishonored. And no matter if an individual carries a degree or not, based off a of race, we're stigmatized one way. But once a felony comes into play, you're automatically in specific, specific class. And you kind of have to begin to climb and fight your way out of that dishonor that we all experience. And I think that's really important, especially like when we think about spaces like PEP, who really looks at when we engage with an individual, that it, the engagement starts inside the prison, especially when we start to talk about reentry work. And one of the things that I do with PEP is reentry work. And I remember us being in our very infantile stages and really questioning what does the logistics of a person who's been incarcerated attending campus. And a lot, much of my experience was basically extremely hard, mainly because we were still figuring out what that actually was and what we needed, whether it was mental health, whether it was housing, whether it was familial support. And this is some of the stuff that we actually had grappled with up until the, we're at the place where we are today, where we could definitively say we are wrestling with those issues. And it kind of gives me goosebumps because it took a lot of work, sacrifice on all the students' behalf and one of the best thing I see coming out of like some of the work that we did was some, some of the research we're conducting now about that in incarceration. What the project essentially started out as like a pilot program that wanted to look at the web or the interconnections between the community and the prison system and how that affects the community at large and how it casts like this web or this shadow over in neighborhoods and how does that translate into generational disparities. Um, one of the most important things that we started to do is like we started to conduct interviews. I did many interviews and so has Zachary and many other um, um, PEP alum. And in my particular way, uh, in, with my particular experience um, upon doing interviews, one of the things that I end up finding is that people who have done over eight to 10 years in prison, their family has spent over $100,000 supporting them including lawyer's fees, commissary, packages, phones, everything. And then I question that if an individual is not incarcerated for that long, how does the wealth of that community shift, especially if it's directly impacting many people? And it is a web and it's also national. So it makes us really look at how big the scope is and who is it really affecting. And I think Loic Waquan's piece really looks at that and he kind of pushes back the, against the idea of mass incarceration because it's not the masses that are affected, but it's a really specific group of people, primarily poor people, who are really affected and are really being policed because everyone is not policed equally. But one of the most important things that I think about also with the notion of racial dishonor and what Stevenson went through is that, especially with my experience with being reincarcerated at the height of COVID, and what it took for everyone to get me out, how to go against that racial dishonor and what it is to take this notion of being a public safety hazard, one, because of a disease, two, because I'm a person who has been incarcerated. So the whole notion of me having to be there and, so, and, and basically people believing that I deserve to be there is one of the underlying things that as an individual, especially like with with the work that PEP does is that to begin to unravel the idea of us deserving to be in a university space and what does that entail? Does that entail a certain amount of privilege so on and so forth? But what happens when that privilege is relinquished through race and class and a felony conviction?
But these are just some of the overall um, arching themes that hopefully I plan that we can speak about today and just really address. Um, so I can officially hand it over to Zachary and stop sweating. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll take over now. All right. So I just want to begin by saying how happy I am to be part of this um, NYU Reads event. And as you probably know, NYU Reads is centered around a common reading every year. And this year is um, Brian Stevenson's book, Trust Mercy. Right, and this text, it gives us sort of a, a look into the disparities that are faced, disparities and inequalities faced by African-Americans within the criminal justice system. So um, when I was reading this book, uh, one of the things that like stood out to me is because, or that, that I thought about while I was reading the book is sort of like abolition. And so I'm framing this alongside uh, like an abolitionist framework, right? So with this book, we had three other supplementary readings, and one of them was an article from the New York Times Magazine entitled, Is Prison Necessary? Ruth Wilson Gilmore Might Change Your Mind, and it was written by um, Rachel Kushner. And um, the article starts off by um, Dr. Gilmore being asked by some children, basically, if she was an abolitionist. And sort of the concept of abolition you have to be, you have to have sort of like a broad train of thought. And it's like imagining a new world, right? Where prisons are not a thing, right? There's no prisons. So when, when you try to bring up these ideas of abolition, people will look at you as if you're speaking a different language, that's, a language that's foreign to them, right? So um, instead of asking how in the future without prisons, we will deal with so-called violent people, abolitionists ask how we resolve inequalities to get people the resources they need long before Gilmore says that they um, mess up. So like, sort of like what Nikhil was saying, it's kind of, it's, there's kind of been like a prison as put as a priority to deal with uh, social issues in the US society, right? And as I mentioned, abolition is sort of a way of imagining a new world, right? A world where emphasis is placed on investment in um, social issues that contribute to what we consider as um, sort of crime, right? So Gilmore, she calls prisons uh, a catch-all for all social problems. And um, there's, when, when people speak of abolition, sort of the counter argument to abolition is sort of like reform. Like you can't, there can't be a world without police, prisons, and some sort of like carceral justice apparatus that will, I guess, maintain law and order within society. So the counter argument for that is, is reform, right? So if you look at the prison as we know it today, it, 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 itself, it itself is actually a reform, right? From previous forms of punishment, which were seen as violent and, or somewhat inhumane. And over time, the prison itself has somewhat morphed back into what it was supposed to um, replace, which was an institution of punishment that um, was very violent and sort of inhumane, right? So um, I'm gonna give you a quote, another quote from, um, from this is from Ruth, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. She says, so many of these so-called remedies don't end up diminishing the system. They regard the system as something that can be fixed by removing and replacing a few elements, right? So basically there's a call to like, dismantle the system. We know it's broken, we know it's racist. We can't just simply uh, put body cameras on police and that's gonna solve everything. We can't add more black officers to the police force. It's not simply gonna change anything. It's not gonna change the disparity in race in prison. It's not gonna change anything, right? So what we need to do is sort of imagine a world in which we didn't need prisons, right? And this, 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 this thought of this is sort of like far-fetched. But it's not, it's not really. It just cause it, you just need to use your mind and critically think and use your imagination to sort of um, just imagine a world in which is like stronger forms of community and people work together, basically. It's like a philosophy. So I was, when I was reading uh, Just Mercy, I saw that um, Brian said that he studied philosophy in college. And um, upon graduation, he sort of like shied away from philosophy because he realized that there was sort of like no money in that industry. And sort of like with my time with PET, I realized like a lot of ideas are not necessarily like gonna make you the most money, 
but it's sort of like what is your role in the world in the, in the larger society right so um i understand like trying to formulate um thoughts of abolition may not make me a millionaire but those little thoughts i can put some of those things into action and contribute to a sort of a, a better world in a sense where um prisons are not necessarily needed and um yeah abolition and decolonial thought just like creating like or formulating ideas that people think are um, sort of impossible thank you so much zach and jose and nikhil um we have a little bit of time for discussion and i'd like to start by just going back a very quick round now through the three of you to have any initial response or reflections on what you heard from other members of the panel. So Nikhil, first thoughts, best thoughts. Quick, quick thoughts, since we're doing a quick round, I want to say, first of all, thanks to Zach and Jose again. And the thing I think I want to highlight and lift up in what both of you said is, is that coming out of prison and coming out of the experiences that you've had, uh, and then beginning to think about what you wanted to study and the kind of knowledge that you wanted to help produce um, has been, I think, from my experience, one of the re most remarkable things about our program. Uh, when I said at the end of my remarks that the practice of freedom requires working with others uh, is, it is really true. I feel like we have worked together um, we have learned so much from you. You've obviously learned a lot from us too, coming from different sides of the university prison divide and trying to think about how we bridge that gap between the university and the prison. You know, and one of the things that I was really struck by in what you said, Zach, was that um, it's very hard these days not to think that what your purpose in life is, is to kind of make money for you and yours, right? And I think especially when you've gone through the kind of experience of dis, uh, dispossession and deprivation um, that prison represents. But the fact that what you're saying here today is that you're learning in this moment about what kinds of ideas and what kinds of practices can begin to kind of heal the fractures in the social relationships and communities that you grew up in, you know, to me is like the, the greatest lesson that we can sort of take away from this work because that is really what we're trying to build here. You know, when NYU um, was founded, it was called a private university in the public interest. There, th that's not the easiest thing to do. It's not the easiest thing to pull off. And I'm not saying NYU is always successful and I'm not trying to trumpet our successes as, as, as exemplary of anything. But we do have a public role to play here in a university in a city like this. And you guys are really the ones who are leading the way for us. So I really want to commend you for that and to thank you for that. And I'd love to hear anything more that you have to say about your experiences as, as knowledge workers, as knowledge producers. Thank you. Jose, a couple sentences on just first thoughts, best thoughts after hearing from your panelists. Yeah, um, one of the things I really like appreciate with what Zach has said, especially like um, during like our current political moment where, you know, I hit the streets as, as many other people did and had an opportunity to be what Nikhil says as a knowledge producer and sit on many different spaces or circles and really discuss abolition um, through the best way possible. Um, um, especially having sat on discussions with Ruti, Matt Angela, and getting it from the horse's mouth, and them saying it's just a framework. It's just a way for us to forward that philosophical thought and the creative ways necessary to ask people about preve prevention and how could we possibly reduce harm and really also lead through the sense of that life is sacred, that's our bottom line, and how do we protect life at all moments Without also, without also causing further harm, which is what we like tend to look at what abolition is. And really 
like encounter like really hard questions, which is what happens if when, when someone is violent, is a rapist, is these things and really kind of grapple with those issues, especially when we look at um, people as an abolitionist, one thing you don't believe is reincarcerating people. So what does justice looks like? What does mercy look like for the officers as well? If we don't believe in reincarceration, do they fit in that ideal? Or is it just one-sided? And it's really grappling with how does how to revision a new system or not a new system, a new world, and just having that space to basically create a pedagogical round circle. But yeah. Thank you, Jose. And Zach, first thoughts, best thoughts after hearing from the panelists um, or about your role as a knowledge producer at, at PEP. And I'll just, yeah, remind you to unmute. Perfect. I was gonna speak to what uh, Jose had mentioned about uh, sort of like the debt research that we've been doing and sort of like the, just the, the tremendous spending that's done, right? There's, we know about the, the physical, the physicality associated with uh, incarceration, how your body is taken, but now we're starting to look into the relationship between the family and the person in, incarcerated. And we're trying to, or we're not trying to, we actually are um, mapping those, um, those relationships as well as the spending associated with um, incarceration. So there's like so many different aspects of the carceral state, like Nikhil said, it's like, it's like gradually expanding and like um, just being, I guess, knowledgeable and or trying to learn, learn a little bit of each one so we could sort of like deconstruct them little by little. I think it's like really important and that's just like, a dual, dual, duality of like knowledge that I guess I've picked up from like being involved with the carceral state and then studying it from as an academic. So I guess, yeah. And, and, and to dovetail, like there's a piggybacking, but also like during that process about like picking up those skills as a scholar, as an interviewer and being credentialed to do so and kind of transitioning from like what I was saying earlier from that that, that racial dishonor, that carceral dishonor that's there and being included in on the conversation, not as a token, as a person who's shaping further academic thought. And I think that space that PEP provides in building that is of paramount importance, especially moving forward in our time. Muted. I'm muted. Thank you. Nikhil, do you want to add to that? Sorry. I, I was going to oh, tell Thanks. <laughs> um, we're about to move now to, to open q and I love this conversation that's building. And really, the first question that we're getting is along these same lines um, from the perspective of what is the difference that education really does make in this big crisis? So the question reads, I've unfortunately heard that even when completing education, many formerly incarcerated individuals are unable to get a job. How do we address the issue of education alongside the fact that education alone might not be enough? I think this is a great question. I know Pep thinks a lot about this. So Nikhil, I don't know if you want to respond first. I think we would be being really dishonest if we thought education was a magic solution to um, the manifold crisis that we are describing here, one that not only encompasses so many people, but that has all of these tributaries throughout communities and their relationships with each other. Um, I think both Jose and, and Zach have really eloquently discussed what it means to have so many people ripped out of communities. People who labor, people who, who do, do the work of caring for each other, for the elderly, for children, um, the tremendous financial burdens that, that, that prison places on not only the individual incarcerated who loses all of this time in the workforce, but all the people who end up supporting somebody in prison, both emotionally and financially. So the, the, co the costs are, are staggering and education is a piece one of the pieces that education provides, it seems to me, is it provides, as Jose said, um, a certain kind of authority, accreditation, and ability to have a platform from which to speak and work and do uh, work that may be better remunerated. We know that that's partly how education works. There's a, there's a specific value to it. Um, but the other way that we've talked about education here that I think Zach emphasized is, is that education is about trying to figure out how we put relevant knowledge to work in the world 
that actually addresses the real issues that we're facing. And I think that's some of the work that the PEP students, especially the ones involved directly in research are doing. Um, and that work has to then be tied to um, not just um, the educational institution, but to work in communities, work with other organizations, work with municipal agencies, you know, and that's one of the things that I think inspired the vision of PEP, which is when we say the urban re research university has a role to play in addressing the problem of mass incarceration, we're thinking about or hyper incarceration to use Lacan's term, we're thinking about how we're a hub, how we're a way to connect up the different kinds of agencies, capacities, and resources that we actually need to address this kind of issue and this problem in our city and beyond, right? And it's not just a question of providing education, although that's part of it. It's also about employment. It's also about uh, policing and the violence of policing and figuring out how to reduce and mitigate that. Um, and it's also about um, social resources and figuring out how to redirect those into the communities that need them. So it's a very, very big, big issue. And I think it's one that we don't obviously tackle by ourselves, uh, but I think it is the problem that we set for ourselves in the way we understand the problem that we're facing. And I think we should also be honest that we're facing a very difficult period ahead. Um, we have an economy that's now suffering from very high levels of unemployment due to the COVID pandemic. Um, there's going to be much more pressure on municipal budgets. Um, I think we already see some of the law and order rhetoric creeping back in to the way in which um, uh, officials are talking about uh, what's going on in the streets. Uh, we have to be very vigilant to keep the impetus that we have found with this work and keep it moving forward. Thank you, so well put. I now have a, a question directed to Jose and then a, a second one that I'll direct to Zach. Um, Jose, there was a second part to this question asking about the specific role that community partnerships, with, which Nikhil just mentioned, in doing this kind of work. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about all the different kinds of work that PEP does that are both on campus and beyond campus. We've heard about research as one piece. Can you say more about the community building pieces and also how those might be related to research? All right. That's a taller order than what I anticipated, but um, I got it. Uh, so one of the things is like I had stated, stated earlier, it's like re-entry. Re-entry for me has worked as a pathway in order to kind of like find out what resources do exist for people who have been incarcerated. Um, and upon me coming out is finding out that there aren't many resources, but the ones that we do find are like basically how would you say reference people to go go to are of quality services and of substantial and they're stable. How we come across that is um, one of many ways is through social networking. Um, one of the groups or trainings that we had officially had was with Brick Media um, out, in, um, out in Brooklyn. And one, they do trainings, but also they put you in their network for job opportunities. Um, over the course of this summer, uh, we had uh, uh, a peer educator workshop where I and two other um, students who graduated from NYU as a part of PEP um, alum, um, we held the workshop but also had guest speakers and a perfect example of how community networks work through connections is um, Mara Pratter um, who works for Made in New York came and did a discussion as a guest speaker but now one of my friends who's also formerly incarcerated not connected to PEP but a far, uh, part of the broader community in which we're talking about needs a job. And Mara Prada is gonna be able to plug them into a job. So this is some of the ways in which some of these small connections happen. And some of the work that we actually do is like with housing, Ignacio House is one, one definitive space where guys can officially live there at a reduced rate as long as they're enrolled in school. But Ignacio House also provides space for anybody who has been incarcerated and is trying to like live a really holistic life. So that's essentially when we build our partnerships is to question one, how does this work for our students? And then I myself use those resources to redistribute amongst people I know so that everyone could partake if we have the space to do so. Thank you so much. And Zach, we had a specific question to you that says, first, Zach, excellent job. 
could you give us one to two concrete examples or suggestions about how the theory of abolition can be applied in the current moment in New York City? Well, I think that right now we're in like an interesting time in, in, the, in the sense that a lot of people are sort of out of jobs, out of work. So like one of the main things that's tied to abolition is sort of like a reinvestment in social programs and sort of like not necessarily welfare, but just like a redistribution of um, resources and importance to those resources. So instead of a strong reliance on carceral um, spending, maybe if some of the spending was uh, reallocated to um, like food banks or job training, it would be less opportunities for people to do things that would put them in the way of the police and uh, I guess the carceral system. That's is that good enough? Or? Yeah, that's more than good enough. Um, and a follow-up question um, that that is to this is what is, and I'll pass this to Nikhil first, but the first part of the question is how can NYU students get involved with PEP? And I'll just say um, that we will be having more opportunities available and our website is the perfect place to find out when those come up. Um, but Nikhil, this dovetails to another question um, which is, you know, what, what do we do um, about the, the current climate of wealth inequality in the U.S. Um, when we're thinking about an issue like hyperincarceration? And I think this is maybe a, another way to say this is how do we deal with so many enormous structural problems all at one time? Um, and how is it that we're finding maybe hope or uh, some success, some small success? in this work? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it is easy sometimes to become overwhelmed when you start to take on board the systemic nature of some of the problems we face. And sometimes that can be kind of the en enemy of initiative because it becomes so overwhelming that we feel like, oh my God, we can't possibly tackle this. You know, when we started as a group of faculty, staff, and administrators thinking about prison education, we just thought, well, you know, prisons are a problem. People in prison often end up in prison because they haven't had access to education. What can we do? And many of us just thought really small at that time, well, we can go and maybe teach in prison, teach a course in prison here and there. We didn't think we would be able to begin to build something that would basically be an NYU commitment to uh, create a whole program that would not only teach college and prison, but would actually think more broadly and more holistically about the problem of hyper-incarceration in our city and how we might intervene in it. And I don't make, and I don't think any of us make any great claims for being the, the agent of, of changing this wholesale. Uh, this has to be adopted in other places. It has to be replicated. Every research university in every major city where hyper-incarceration exists, which is pretty much every city in the United States, needs to have something like this, needs to figure out how you grow these spaces, right? Um, because we won't, we won't defeat it systemically once and for all. It's, it's more like what Zach said, we'll sort of chip away at it, we'll erode it from within. We'll erode it from within with different kinds of practices, with different kinds of values and orientations. Abolition, as people use the term, is, is a kind of horizon. I'm not interested in getting in an argument with people about, um, do we, can we really do without prisons? Can we really do without police? Which is always the fight you get in when you talk about abolition. I'm not gonna have that argument. Abolition is a horizon, which is that's where we're moving towards. We're trying to think about how we erode what has become a massive and overwhelming system from within in the ways in which we can. You know, and I think that we can do that where we're starting right now. And let me, let's also be honest about this. This isn't just about the prison and police, it's also about the university. We're talking about reinventing the university here. We're talking about the university's mission and purpose, especially the university that sits in a wealthy city like New York City amidst a lot of poverty and deprivation around it. Right? What is the role of an urban research university in the city in which it is, 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 is located? And let me say one last thing, and this relates to the current moment, and I'm not picking on Trump, okay? But you know Trump only paid $750 in taxes and no, no, in, in, in the last few years, a year, and no taxes for 10 years before that. 
Meanwhile, I was reading a story this morning about a substitute school teacher in Wyoming who is being charged with a felony for Medicare fraud because she took some Medicare assistance and then got a job as a substitute teacher, which put her over the poverty line and th therefore made her ineligible for Medicare. So it, was, it amounted to a few thousand dollars, and it was a, an error in some ways on her, her part. I mean, perhaps there was some level of saying, hopefully no one will discover this, but we're talking about a few thousand dollars, and this woman is likely to go to jail. And this is a kind of just an illustration of what happens now. The carceral system is the way in which the society catches poor people, disciplines poor people. Right? But meanwhile, we have a, a whole realm of, of, of concentrated wealth and power, which operates with relative impunity. You know? And I think we need to correct the, balance, the imbalance here. You know, it is incumbent upon us. Um, and obviously, that's going to be a challenge for everybody in the coming period. Thank you. And to have our final words from Jose and Zach, I want to pose the same question to you both. Um, what is the difference, given everything that Nikhil just laid out in his response, what is the difference that higher education and really intellectual work makes? What is the difference that putting this kind of intellectual work in your own life as a priority, what is the difference that makes as we carry on through the long, um, uncertain struggle uh, amidst all the big challenges? Um, one of the things I always like approach like intellectual work as not like educational lifting, rather as this form of spiritual lifting. And I remember also having a conversation with Nikhil, I think it was years ago, you might have forgotten about it. But the question is, is how do we politicize our students? How do we make sure that they're actors in our community? And there's no definitive answer for that. But I think it's a coming upon the people who have the opportunity to be in these spaces to spread it to their communities and from a framework of communal of communal care that every life is sacred and everybody has a space in a university, whether it's vicariously through myself or many others, but also having access to those resources. The only reason why I say that is because one of the next phases we have to look at it in our broader political movement and how a, is how a community is caring for each other. Um, a few blocks down from where I live, I go and I volunteer at a park, but I also give and share the resources that I have so that they can have discussions uh, um, and frame how they are educating themselves and how they are spreading the word and, and engage with their, their community. And I really approach that through, through a space of me not being from Bushwick or Bedstown, I'm from Sunset Park. So it's very, very specific to how and who is entitled to speak in those spaces and what framework they feel is best for themselves. Whether it has to be mine or somebody else's, that's not my decision. And it, and it, brought, and it goes down to the basic idea of how we're empowering each other and how that empowerment looks in the real world and how does that mitigate the state's interaction with people and just hope that it has some real world effect and know that PEP only operates as one gear of many other turning gears and it can't solve all the issues at all. Doesn't even make the claim to like when the kill says, but it's a part of working towards decarceration. Can you repeat the question? I just wanna make sure I answer it correctly. Yeah, thank you Jose for that. Really the question Zach is just, can you say about some, a word, a final word about what the role of intellectual work or, or higher education means for you in the midst of these bigger challenges that are with us, have been with us, and probably will be with us into the future? Um, I don't, hmm, how should I answer this? You could answer also another question, which is just what has higher education meant to you uh, in your life? Um, I think it's the same knowing you. Yeah, I guess like it kind of, it kind of like altered my life. Like, um, because a lot of people, we're, like, we're all released from prison, I guess, but coming home and, like, going to school kind of, like, set me on a straight path as opposed to, like, some of the other people. So I can honestly say, like, education is sort of like a privilege to me, and, it, and, it, and it's sort of like a, a protective privilege in which I'm not exempt from the arm of the state still, because as Nikhil spoke about, 
this is sort of like an extension of the carceral state, like parole. But education has like allowed for me to sort of like duck the arm of the state, you know, and then sort of be able to uh, verbalize certain terms of, of like basically learning the terms of the things that were happening to me, the systems that I sort of like was in, right? And it's teaching me to um, identify these terms and then basically pass this knowledge down to other people who don't necessarily like, they don't necessarily know exactly what to look for. I guess, cause like I said before, about like the duality of knowledge, like being involved with the carceral system and also like sort of examining it from an academic lens. So it gives me sort of like a interesting perspective, like the best of both worlds. So yeah, it's like a- That's awesome. Education. Amazing, thank you so much. I believe we are now turning it to Gigi DePico who will conclude our event. Thank you so much. What an important, urgent conversation. So much to think about and act on. Uh, thanks so much to our, to our really brilliant panelists, Nikhil, Jose, Zach, Caitlin, for your words and your wisdom this afternoon and to President Hamilton for his generous introduction. If you wanna learn more about hyper-incarceration or prison education, please see the chat for links to the articles mentioned during the panel additional resources on these issues, uh, as well as on racial justice and on anti-racism are also available on PEP's website, on OGI's website, on NYU Reads website, and on the NYU LibGuide on Just Mercy. Uh, and links to all of those are in the chat as well. Uh, today's panel was our third NYU Reads event, a co-sponsorship with OGI's Global Scholars and Innovators series. If you haven't had a chance to read Just Mercy, I invite you to do so. Ebook and audiobook copies are accessible through NYU libraries. Our next event, Confronting White Power in 2020 with Ibram Kendi and Kathleen Ballou, moderated by Linda Gordon, takes place on Monday, October 5th at 7 p.m. And on Monday, October 12th at 12.30 p.m., Brian Stevenson will join us to discuss Just Mercy and his work with the Equal Justice Initiative. Please register for those events. And while I'm urging you to register, please register to vote because as we've been reminded today, freedom is a practice. Thank you for tuning in. Stay well. <laughs>